Jai Hind, Jai Bharat, and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achind. Today, I have with me Vice Admiral Anup Singh, who's going to tell us something a little more about grey zone operations by the Chinese Navy slash militia within the South China Sea, and of course, close to the Indian Ocean as well. What is the Chinese signal? Have they started their salami slicing tactics within the ocean as well? Because this is something. Their activities, short of war, they used to conduct on the land borders with India. Have they started doing this with other countries in the ocean, sir? Thank you so much for taking out the time and helping us understand the Chinese motives within the maritime domain. Thank you, Adi. Always a pleasure, sir. You know, just an overview uh, of the situation. First and foremost, you know, you have this incident that happened uh, recently where a Chinese ship. Uh, now the narrative says it tried to bump into the American ship. Uh, the other narrative says it was just an aggressive maneuver. Whatever it was, it wasn't within the paradigm of, uh, you know, maritime sailing rules. How do you see this sort of a belligerence uh, by the Chinese towards, especially towards the U.S.? Well, I would, I would, I would say that um, it's uh, you know they they seem to have learned all this from their. Um, much younger and much lesser friend, Pakistan, <laughs> because the the only navy which was known to do things of this nature was the Pakistan Navy, even when it was very small, did not have a sufficient number of ships. I must say that at the time of partition, the Pakistani uh, uh, naval officers were having been trained under the same flag as one nation having been trained under the British, were of a different sort. But uh, in recent years, what we've seen, particularly an incident that happened between 2010 and 12, um, somewhere around 12, I think, uh, was a very immature action against an Indian naval ship. And they were deliberately trying to provoke, knowing fully well that we, being a mature nation and a mature navy, our commanding officers are trained and our personnel are trained ne never to get provoked and, and let peace uh, be retained. Um, let, let no one fire a shot in anger. So it actually hit the, the, the safety nets uh, which are on the helicopter deck of our ships right aft. Uh, the, it came so close that it grazed past those helicopter nets, uh, damaging something. These were lowered because the, our ship was about to carry out some helicopter operations. And then, of course, uh, simultaneously, the entire ship's company, the crew of that Pakistani ship, was shouting away uh, in a manner which is reminiscent of road rage incidents or of... Uh, uh, or of rowdy um, students uh, not understanding a particular situation. Uh, now, the Chinese have suddenly found that this is their, this, this, this is the, 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 the same habit that they should uh, emulate. And uh, it is most ridiculous because good order at sea starts with navies. Not with fishing craft, not with merchant ships. Those ships of the mercantile marine and, and fishing vessels actually learn examples for, from navies of their host nation, parent nation, as well as other naval ships. So it is the most ridiculous example that the Chinese are setting. And this is not the first time. This has been going on since about 2009. And some incidents, of course, took place in 2002 or three when the EP3 accident took place and the Chinese pilot lost his life, all for it because of his fault. And then some other jets, you remember, formatted upon the US Air Force, the US Navy EP3 and forced it to land on Hainan and later released and re later released when the US government apologized for the death of the pilot. Now. The point is that none of these things are supposed to happen, neither in the air nor at sea. In the air, they are much more dangerous. They are 
they risk the aggressor more than uh, the victim, as mm. happened in 2003. Uh, at sea, you cannot have a military vessel or a military platform doing this in peacetime because a shot can be fired in anger by the other side. Or an incident can become a, an unbearable accident, uh, resulting in loss of life and material. And that only, that only spoils relations between two nations, as, as has been the case in this incident. Even though the Chinese vessel passed about 150 yards ahead, 150 yards, even at 12 or 15 knots, economical speed of the U.S. Navy ship um, is very, very little and can become very damaging and can, can, can turn into an uncontrolled situation for the two vessels. Because there's far too much momentum in a warship of, let's say, six or 8,000 tons. Mm. You can't apply brakes and hope that the tires will have great grip on the road. You take a large number of lengths of the ship before you come to a stop by putting your engines astern in reverse, in reverse gear. So uh, this has been happening and uh, the, the probable reason, as has been reported by the net and by some commentators from the US is that uh, once again, the Chinese wanted to say that you are in our, our waters. And that means that they consider uh, Taiwan as part of mainland China. And the Taiwan Strait is being de-recognized by the Chinese as an international strait. And they deliberately do keep doing it uh, with U.S. warships. In this case, the U.S. warship also had a Canadian warship in company, Montreal. So this is, this is actually uh, a series of most ridiculous examples. Imagine what are, what are we teaching to the generations to follow in the Chinese name, that this is the norm and this is the way to behave at sea. It is most dangerous. Something very, I mean, you, you, you've you taken it at a very different philosophical level, which is, I mean, a lot of people fail to understand what is the use of such moves. You're, you're trying to showcase something fair enough, but if there was a, for the lack of a better word, military mistake, you know, yeah. and that's a phrase that has actually caused wars. Absolutely, absolutely. So there has also been, you know, these these militia ships that have been cl clashing with these Vietnamese ships. There have been militia ships that have been clashing with the Philippine ship. Uh, there have been reports of certain boys that have been deployed in that area, uh, navigational boys and stuff like that. There has been reports of these ships anchoring very close to certain islands. What is China trying to do? And when, when, when it's confronted, it says, no, 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 it's just a fishing vessel. It's a, you know, uh, it's, it's not anything to do with military. And, you know, that's the narrative that they pull across. And that's very interesting to me that they're trying to just keep that thing away from the military domain yes. and keep it. What is the real purpose here? Is there uh, something you that know, we are not understanding, sir? Yeah, there is a phrase... Um, which goes by the acronym MOW, M O O W, military operations other than war. Now, these are not military vessels. So, military operations other than war uh, are in, are actually, they define those, is a definition which actually stands for operations which can be taking place either on your own mainland hmm. or at sea, not involving two belligerents. That means not the navies or the militaries of two nations. That one of the actors is not in military uniform. However, MOOW cannot be expected ever and ever to include fishing vessels 
So the only country which is known to have this maritime militia is China. And to give you an example of the kind of importance they attach and the kind of hierarchical order they have, they have uh, allowed this organization, which is not really an organized force, uh, to, to, to accept is the fact that in the year 2012, when um, towards the end of 2012, when President Xi Jinping was not yet fully president, uh, he took over that uh, hat. He wore that hat only in March of 13, as I recall. But he was already general secretary. He had he was photographed on a fishing vessel where along with two, three other fishing vessels, alongside this fishing vessel, people seem to be in certain kind of uniform. But they were, but, but it was a clear indication of this is how maritime militia is going to be expanded and has state approval, has state recognition. Now, it is since then that it has multiplied, this force has really multiplied. And it is hard to believe that any Chinese fishing vessel will not be part of the maritime militia anywhere. To give you another example, you know, uh, this is where I say that um, even in politics, one needs to be extremely careful on the kind of actions that political parties take, uh, whether against other political parties or in giving, in, in accepting speeches which are delivered by their leaders or by their lower rung people, which are made public. Because you are, if though they are not in line with the accepted ethos, and of national principles, then the, then the generations that follow feel that these are our role models and this is how we must behave. Now, for example, if a, if a political party leader goes and, uh, you know, wraps a blanket uh, around himself in the month of January, uh, on one of the main roads in central Delhi, very close to where a Republic Day Parade is going to take place and says that I will not go till so-and-so demand is met. There are hundreds and thousands of young supporters who are smiling mm. with confidence. So what is the message that is being conveyed? And what kind of cultural shock will the future generations face? They will feel this is the way to behave. No, sir. Hmm. Precisely in the same manner, if you allow this kind of activity by the civil society, in this case, the fishing community, that you have allowed military type of action, an uncultured military type of action by the fishing community, Everyone raises his arm and says, hail the nation. So you have today cultivated, that country has today cultivated hundreds of thousands of fishermen in this practice. And they are trained and obviously being groomed to act in consonance with the principles declared by the Communist Party. And what are those principles? Go and take over Scarborough Shoal, form a ring around a Philippine Coast Guard or naval vessel. Don't allow it to leave a lagoon. To hell with principles laid down in international law. Once you've been told that this is our territory, just go and surround it. Now, strictly speaking, I have always said... Um, in the uh, early years of the last decade um, in conferences 
on the South China Sea that please try and remember firstly the ocean is not territorial. Yes. You cannot draw lines on the ocean. You cannot draw lines and call it a 9 dash or 11 dash line. Secondly, you are already damaging the culture of future generations. Now, to give you an example, a very large, you know that the Chinese are known um, as the worst example in the world for illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing called IUU fishing. They go um, across all oceans. The only coastlines of where the only exclusive economic zones in which they do not do illegal fishing for their own profit are the American coast, the North American coast, that means US and Canada, and particularly the US coast, and the West European coast, because coast guards and coast watch and custom marine customs, etc., are very active in these countries, and don't, they don't spare criminals of this kind. And the Chinese are the only nation where, who own a large fleet of what are called fish factories, these are large vessels, not small fishing craft, which are which have a processing unit inside. They harvest fish from the sea by hundreds and thousands of tons. And then smaller vessels of China, of the Chinese fishing fleet, come, take over processed fish, and directly export to those nations which are accepting Chinese exports. And most of this fish is caught outside. Now, in one such incident of fine. Chinese fishing vessel, a large fishing vessel, was somewhere in 2014 or 15. I recall was fishing illegally in the Argentine EEZ, so far away from China. Oh. And the Argentinian Coast Guard was very active and they realized that it is a vessel which is not registered in Argentina. In any case, they didn't have such large ones. And when it came close to interrogate, the Chinese vessel, and its name was found, it, the Chinese vessel was warned to get out of the EZ, otherwise we will board you and arrest the ship as well as crew, because you already caught a lot of fish illegally in our EZ. Now, guess what did the Chinese try to do? The Chinese vessel came charging at the, the Argentinian Coast Guard vessel to hit it because it happened to be la as large or larger than the Argentinian vessel. So the Argentinian vessel had no, left nothing to chance, did exactly what is laid down in laws of the sea and in national laws. And therefore, in not only self-defense, but also to deter this fellow, it fired across the bows of the Chinese vessel. And when the Chinese vessel did not behave, as I recall, you could check it and I, I, I will stand corrected, it fired directly onto the vessel and the vessel sank. Now, the Chinese never protested. Can you imagine? Because they understand a taste of their own medicine, nothing else. They knew they were doing it illegally. They knew that the vessel had tried to ram into a military vessel, a Coast Guard vessel of Argentina. When the Argentinian vessel was right in saying, you, are in, you have violated my EEZ rules, my waters, and you are illegally fishing in my waters. Elsewhere, where they do this kind of a thing in ASEAN waters, the only example that comes to my mind is the, the bold Indonesian fishing minister till six or seven years ago. And if you, if you, I forget her name, if you click photographs of, if you click on the internet, you will also find caricatures of uh, that woman minister being shown carrying, wearing a lot of small arms because she had become ruthless with those who were violating the Natuna Island 
uh, of Indonesia, it's EEZ, which is very rich in fish. So Chinese vessel was caught amongst many other nations' vessels and kept in one of the Natuna Islands of a Natuna, one of the Natuna Islands. And then when the Chinese Coast Guard vessels used to come close by in order to try and steal away their own vessel, this minister ordered blowing up all those who were all those fishing vessels which were arrested, including the Chinese. Wow. This also this also happened in 2013 or 14. She was, she was known as the fish lady, if I remember. Yeah. So this vessel was blown out of the water. Yeah. No nonsense. So so the Chinese military militia, the Chinese uh, maritime militia, is an illegal force. It cannot be called a force. It cannot be called an organization of the state. Fishing vessels around the world are known to be the eyes and ears, and particularly in, in countries like India, where 2611 took place, and thereafter the Navy and the Coast Guard started teaching at double down speed all fishing vessels to say we used to have community association and classes for you people in your villages. You did not understand that you are the eyes and ears, and now it is being made mandatory. All coastal states in India and union territories which are which are adjoining the sea were ordered by the union government to hereafter make sure that all these fishing vessels and their fishing communities and their villages are uh, told that this is mandatory education. So they are called eyes and ears of the Navy and the Coast Guard. Particularly now that all this has been expanded, the Navy has uh, handed over this duty to the Coast Guard, but keeps a, keeps an overall security, maritime security coordinator eye on this. It's insane that a country like this would... This is basically maritime terrorism, if I may. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know? You're, you're, you're ramming ships, you're stealing fish, you're... Yes. I mean, for the lack of a better word, I remember about a year or two ago, the Chinese were dumping human waste in the South China Sea to the fact that it, it, it could be seen from space after that. God. And it, it was terrible. They they'd made such uh, piles of it that it could be seen from space. And... Whoever viewer actually sees this, you can Google it. It's it's very readily available. It was uh, off the coast of Indonesia where all this stuff was happening. So, but this in contrast with, um, you know, the China ASEAN talks, they're talking about creating a code for the South China Sea. You had the uh, the Chinese defense minister, Li, I, I forget his name, uh, in the Singapore uh, Sangrila dialogues talking about cooperation, coordination, and this and that, and the other. His English and the all the English nice words were picked up by him and actually crammed into a speech and put across. So the, mm. the, the narrative is different and the actuality on the ground is different. Absolutely. You How see the... This, you, I mean, you, when, when the ASEAN is sitting down for talks, they, don't they call out the Chinese and say, listen, we're not the problem, you are... What do we what do we keep teaching our children in schools that why did we why did we uh, lose out uh, and and why did we have to uh, extend our struggle for independence for so long against the British because they fall, finally followed a principle of divide and rule hmm. that's what China is doing in Asia how is it that for years together when the uh, rotational um, chairpersonship of ASEAN goes to each country every year to various countries in turn that when it happened to be in Phnom Penh the Cambodians refused to accept a particular sentence in the joint communique blaming China for the nine dash line and for aggression and for assertiveness how is it that the a couple of years later when um, the, the summit took place in Vientiane. Um, Lao PDR refused to accept another sentence. 
because these two countries have been given uh, you know doles and doles and doles and uh, even before bri was announced so china knows what to do in lao pdr for example it has laid so much emphasis on building roads and rail network because it's a landlocked country and all those roads and rail are connecting to mainland china and similarly in cambodia now the uh, greatest fear has come true uh, which we knew a couple of years ago that uh, from the net that the reem uh, naval base is going to be leased out actually that civil port commercial port uh, was leased out to china to build some better infra infrastructure and expand it that has al already happened and adjoining it is reem naval base Yeah. where of course the cambodians refuse to accept but the uh, point is that a lot of people have already seen chinese activity and it might become a base like djibouti if if not a full fledged overseas base certainly the chinese will be allowed access to operate now this is the main reason why they keep it uh, and look at that um, i forget the full name of that uh, treaty with asean in the early years of this millennium um which said went something like peace peace or uh, a treaty of peace and tranquility or something like that uh, did it have any meaning it took months and years to conclude nothing then in 2002 they signed the declaration on the conduct of parties because of chinese aggressive behavior and assertive attitude towards all asean nations most of whom were claimants of certain oh, areas yes. mm. within long before the nine dash line was was ag aggressively claimed in 2009 now the declaration of con of conduct of parties was supposed to be uh, was signed between china and all asean nations did they stick to it they became worse and now the latest attempt is to have the code of conduct what was the doc what is the difference between doc and coc nothing only the language and paragraph numbering will change and the language in each paragraph will change all 10 signatures of foreign ministers of asean in the doc have on the right extreme side the signature of the chinese foreign minister of the time and on the left hand side 10 asean nation signatures didn't make any difference no so do you have any hope nothing at all on the coc you can have treaties and treaties i mean uh, you know the uh, covid uh, episode is going to be written in uh, history manuals in for centuries to come and yet it is during those waves of covid which originated in wuhan and with which china was already struggling to keep the press out to keep the their own citizens out of uh, information out of honest information that they came and quietly carried an assault in the galwan valley mm. so the chinese nation has been known to be untrustworthy we faced it in 1962 just 3 years after hindi chini bye bye by chow and lai Uh, uh traveling the roads in new delhi how is it that we keep trusting the chinese how is it that asean trust the chinese every now and then? you cannot trust the chinese there is no way that the chinese will ever understand moral behavior correct behavior and correct conduct you know i literally every time i get to realize something like that i i i find myself speechless because on one hand the chinese need the world to stay alive and on the second hand they want to kick the world so that they can stay alive and i really don't know which one to believe you know there is and, only and, one reason. there is only one reason and the blame goes to the larger world the larger Absolutely. part of the developed world which was 
hemming at the Chinese and shouting from rooftops to say boycott China, create a new supply chain system. Let us look at Vietnam, Indonesia, India for uh, manufacturing shop floors and cheap labor and uh, larger assembly lines and we will cooperate with these countries. And then all of a sudden, in the last two years, you have seen, uh, I will not name the nations, Western European nations, once again, tying up deals with the Chinese. That is shameful, sir. I mean, I, I find that to be... It, it also includes the fact that money makes the mayor go. And all these countries are still ho um, uh, looking for better profits and better deals where cheap labor and lower and lowest tender will win the deal for them. That's the hypocrisy of the world. Sir. It's, it's amazing. So when we look at actions conducted by the Chinese around India as well, you see the spy ship coming in, you see this, um, you know, they, they'll send a, a small ship to check when, when whenever there's a no time issued, you'll find the Chinese standing there. Yeah, uh, you'll find, you know, they tried to send in some submarines to Sri Lanka, obviously, they couldn't land. Yes. And so these activities are there. What are they trying to do here? I mean, this is again, this this to me tells me that it's just poking around. I mean, it's just irritating people poking around and testing the waters That's as to right. how far you can, you can go. That's right. Uh, it's an old habit. They used to do it in the 90s in the Bay of Bengal, mm. uh, sending ships into Myanmar, which was under the SPDC. And uh, they had very friendly relations. Almost similar things um, are true now. But uh, when it comes to the spy ship, they have been doing it since 2005 with the first of the Yuan Wan class vessels. Which were, uh, which were exact replicas of the Soviet model uh, eavesdropping electronic uh, intelligence picking up ships. And uh, with large parabolic, parabolic antennae, etc. <clears throat> now they've got much more modern Yuan Vans, particularly Yuan Van 7 or 5, which visited two years ago. Five, and six, and seven. Mm -hmm. Now these have got much larger diameter parabolic antenna, which gives you a clear indication that they are not only tracking satellites, but they are also wanting to track missile trajectories. Um, and it is, it is in, in, in layman's language, it is, it is simple radars looking into the space. Um, so they do that. This is also to pinprick. This is also to tease, to also give a uh, give a statement, a tongue-in-cheek statement that we have arrived, do what you feel like. But the the, the way is not to try and uh, uh, do a quid pro quo and bust up your own treasury and start building ships. We have got a ship, by the way. Um, we haven't got a fleet of those ships. and uh, But we don't venture into somebody else's home waters. That is why so many countries in the world back India for its maturity. Uh, but at the same time, we keep our ears and eyes open by various means in trying to find out, in kind, trying to keep track, uh, and successfully in most times, of what the Chinese are up to. When they come in, we do give whether through note verbals to Sri Lanka or to, or to the Chinese themselves to say you are entering on danger, treading on dangerous ground or in dangerous waters, you're trying to eavesdrop. Uh, and if if in the case of a ship which is going into Humbandota as it did, then we don't give diplomatic note verbals because uh, we know the answer from both both those countries would be that he's come for, for r and &R, rest, recreation and recuperation, which could include bunkering, etc. But um, we do send a message to all such countries, which hosts, which are hosts to these vessels, as well as to China, 
that we take notice. We are not sleeping. We take notice and therefore are ready for action should the situation so demand. It's sad state of affairs for a country that uh, these things are. But, you know, uh, the recent actions in the South China Sea kind of... And I've been thinking about it, sir. You see, they've got a front with India. They've got a front with Taiwan. Uh, they tried something with the Solomons. They've kind of taken up a little bit. They've, they've, they've won the battle there. Uh, but South China Sea seems to be a weaker opponent to the Chinese. Are they picking up this fight because they know they're going to win it? To send a message across of strength? They yeah, can't as I it. said, divide us. Uh, as I said, you know, the policy has been divide and rule amongst ASEAN, uh, where they have succeeded with two or three countries at various points of, points of time. But um, to say that they will continue to win is not possible. Uh, it is not true. Because uh, how long can a manipulative individual or nation carry on with this kind of uh, way of life. Hmm. It will have to be a system of give and take. So there will be strong, strong nations and there will be strong leaders who will be able to take China head on. And it doesn't require military strength and economy alone. It requires unity amongst like-minded nations. To give you an example, you know, with so much effort, the Philippines had gone to the, to the after the Scarborough Shoal incident, had gone to the permanent court of arbitration under, under the United Nations, with the, uh, with the, with the, with, with a petition on what China is wrongfully doing in so far as claiming various shoals and reefs in the South China Sea as their own, and also building artificial islands on them. Whereas these have historically been, uh, have uh, historically belonged to Philippines and are within the exclusive economic zone period of Philippines. So amongst, I think, uh, 15, as I recall, um, applications that, uh, uh, 15, points that uh, were in, included in that petition, 14 were accepted in the final judgment. Only one was uh, declined. And all, all that China did was uh, to say that we had right in the beginning said we are not, will not be a party to this hearing because we did not sign in unclause. We, we had made a declaration that we do not go by article so-and-so of United Nations Convention on the Laws of the Sea. So it is not mandatory for China to be a party to this hearing. And the moment the verdict came out in July 2016, they just threw that verdict in the trash. Now, what did the Philippines do? The Philippines, unfortunately, at that time had a change of guard. Just after, not before, the verdict came out. And President Duterte took over and he openly said to his people that I am not, I do not believe in taking up fights with any other nation like China. Hmm. We must cooperate. <laughs> so most of its citizens uh, were quite uh, saddened by this attitude who had actually elected him. And thereafter, it was smooth sailing for the president till the Philippines got a slap once again in intrusions through the maritime militia on, in one case and through the Chinese Coast Guard in another. And now President Marcos has, um, has been different from Duterte. However, recently um, he also did make a statement that uh, we need to we need to improve our relations with China, which in a manner of speaking may be right. Uh, but primarily this is because there is a large amount of FDI which has been uh, promised by China for infrastructure mm -hmm. building in Philippines and so on and so forth. So uh, if 
the Philippines were to stand firm on their point, maybe America has become a little weak in looking after its allies. Maybe there was a there was a uh, negative contribution in so far as alliances were concerned by under President Trump, but otherwise things would have been different had President Duterte insisted on sticking to the international law of the sea, international maritime law and the PCA verdict. Maybe he could have gathered greater support amongst ASEAN nations rather than saying that I do not want to pursue this case. I mean, that's 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 the sad part of it. You've got people who have their own kind of motives and who start off in a whole different story and money money talks and it's just there's no unity. Yeah. So lastly, you know, I've I've learned a lot from you with regards to the Chinese Navy. And there were these recent photographs that went around that talked about cracks on the surface of the Chinese uh, aircraft carriers. Uh, there's rumors about shoddy steel being used. There are rumors about um, the head of the projects and the project engineer being under investigation. What's this all about? Are these just rumors or they, they, they have some substan substance to it, sir? See, I cannot really uh, vouch for the photographs which came out on Twitter a couple of weeks or months ago about the Fujian having a very strange kind of an open crack on the flight deck and a similar one on the Shandong, the second carrier. Uh, the Fujian one was is very scary to look at. Mm -hmm. Huge one. Uh, so I cannot really vouch for the authenticity of these photographs on Twitter. However, one thing is for sure that why did all this not happen on the Liaoning? Because After that all, was a yeah, borrowed carrier. Yes. It was made by the Soviets, and before it could be completed, the Soviet Union itself uh, disintegrated. And, and these therefore, guys it from Ukraine. Yeah, that's right. So these guys picked it up from Ukraine in 2001 or two, saying that we will uh, convert it into a casino or a training vessel mm. and not use it for war, military purposes. And the Ukrainians were happy in selling it off for just 20 million or 2 million. I don't recall, remember exactly how much. And this ship was towed. But the hull was made by those strong Soviets. The strong Soviet system. The which same. has two... No. Which has two very great institutions. One is the Northern Design Bureau. And one is the NPDB. Now, I don't exactly mm -hmm. recall. NP stands for North Point or whatever. Design uh, Bureau. Uh, these two are responsible for creating designs for new types of warships. And all warships have to undergo solid audit or designs. Even if it is serious construction, they keep reviewing designs. Then comes the quality of steel. Now, the Soviets had mastered the art of making B-grade steel. B A grade is supposed to be a normal steel used for merchant ships. B grade is for warships, which is supposed to be much more, not only strong, but tensile and something that can withstand huge shocks of explosions. Etc. In the sense, while it might get punctured, it will not have sympathetic cracking of the remaining hull. Uh -huh. uh, we are fortunate that when the chips were down at the time that we were constructing the, Vic the Vikrant, which has just got commissioned last year. And uh, chips were down in so far as costs of various components and various in raw inputs were concerned. Um, there is a company, state-owned company called Promiti, as I recall, in, this, in the Russian Federation, used to be Soviet Union's company earlier which hiked up the price of warship grade steel, which was supposed to be used for the carrier. And that was becoming unaffordable. So we asked SAIL, 
Steel Authority of India Limited, that rather than going to the private sector and also to the public sector, will you be able to produce steel of this grade? All that sales said was, look, we undertake production on a large scale. This is a quality different from the civil sector and the commercial sector. So to, there is no problem in us creating this type of steel. But you have to give us 5,000 tons, I think, was the minimum requirement. And we said, happily. Now, can you imagine it was less than a year after that negotiation with sale that that steel got produced? Wow. It was much cheaper than what was being sold by the, quoted by the Russians. It was so much comforting to see finally self-reliance has achieved another notch. And now we don't have to look anywhere else for warship grade steel. We were already producing some warship grade steel, but this was of a much thicker better quantity, quality. quality and better, better quality. One is that. Second is that the Varyag was bought from the Soviet Union. I mean, after they disintegrated from the Ukraine. It was made by a very, very robust system, designed and made. Design of the warship of the Varyag and construction was also under the Soviet system. Very robust system. The Shandong and the Fujian may have been copies and extended varieties of the Varyag, but there was no ecosystem created. It was patching up an assemblage of blocks as seen earlier. Yikes. Uh, what have we done? People are blaming us for taking 15 years for making one aircraft carrier because there is an ecosystem which has been created, expanded mm -hmm. from the existing ecosystem. That's where the difference is. From launch to from starting of uh, what we call keel laying or starting with cutting of the first steel plate to launch of the aircraft carrier, China did not take even four years for the Shandong and similarly for Fujian. The whole world is looking at them with awe, in awe. Mouths gaping, my God, missed the industrial revolution and yet it is doing better than the developed world. Because it does not have, it is like in Hindi we say, Chat Mangni Parshadi. It does not have an ecosystem. To give you another example, in the late 90s or early part of 2000, you will recall that the Pakistani Navy had contracted for four ships. I think they were called the F 22, the frigate type 22, not the Western 22, the frigate. Project 22 from the Chinese. The first ship of this project sailed out of a Chinese shipyard with the Pakistani crew and met with a heavy storm. There was a typhoon that was raging at quite a distance away, but the waters through which it traveled during the transit back to Pakistan in the Pacific, uh, it went through very stormy waters and it reported cracks back home. So the Pakis, um, I think, said that don't turn back now that you have covered already so much distance come over here. The Chinese took some time to correct all those. It is not just well seams which had opened up. There were actual cracks. So a ship, when it goes through rough waters, even if they are very moderately or very mildly rough, you imagine it goes through what is called sagging the wavy kind of a movement. And the ship has got weld seams going longitudinally along the length. It has got weld seams that go athwart ship along the beam. And it has got weld seams going vertically from the bilge upwards. Not just for the march, for the mast, but for all compartments and everything for else. Yeah. So there has to be harmony in the architectural design as well as in the construction technique. Only then will you be able to withstand all sorts of 
forces which are unconventional, which happen in stormy waters. So there's a lot that goes into worship making. It's not easy. So anyway, I I think insofar as frigate making is concerned, I've heard that the Chinese and the Turks have come a long way now. They have learned their lessons since the 90s. But um, these are the reasons why the Fujian and the Shandong are stuck. And I am one of those um, who was not a cynic, but was uh, raising, if not an alarm, but just raising a hand to say it is not uh, going to be difficult for the Chinese to bring in the um, the Varyag turned into Liaoning uh, by the year 2020, since it was commissioned in 2012, after they have done operationalization, um, have uh, harmonized uh, jets like the J-15 taking off and landing back safely, that it is not difficult to presume that by 2020, it will be sailing into the Indian Ocean just to show the flag. It hasn't happened. Even if they did it, made a commitment that it will only be used for training purposes or for making into a pub and a casino or a helicopter launch, launching deck. Um, even in the name of training, they have not been able to sail her out. What is the reason? There is only one conclusion one can draw that they haven't been yet been fully successful and confident on reliability of its systems because after all, there was no machinery in the Varyak. Only the hull was there mm. when they brought it from the Soviet Union. So from 2002 to 2012, they took 10 years to put in electronic sensors, electrical systems in for power generation and otherwise, and main propulsion plants. Whether they imported them from the Soviet Union, from the Russians or the Ukrainians, or they made it themselves, most of things are, were being made in China at that time. So it is quite possible that some of those systems are not very reliable as yet. But certainly in Shandong and Fujian, uh, there is a lot of alarm that is being raised. Because they haven't developed an ecosystem. You know, you cannot do what the automobile industry does to say made in India in the initial years of a new model of, of a new uh, uh, trade name car, whereas actually it is a CKD. So in warships, there is nothing called a CKD. Mm. If, you are, if you are doing by copying or by just um, adapting what was earlier done in the Soviet Union and you become very confident and say we made frigates and destroyers and they are doing very well, uh, an aircraft carrier is a different kettle of fish. It goes through a lot of That's stress shocking. in thermal conditions and non-thermal conditions. That's shocking to me, sir. That's shocking. I mean, honestly. And when you come to think of it, the major operations that they show is the older ship. They don't show operations of the newer ships at all. Yeah. Even during the, the, the Taiwan thing, they, they just showed Shandong one takeoff and they took it back and just That's right. it. That's right. In Shandong's oh case, there was a in Shandong's case, there was open news on the net um, that the director of that shipyard, um, after the first four days of the first sea trial, he was sacked. Yeah. Um, for not obviously for trying to keep up with the laid down timelines laid down perhaps by the state that by so-and-so month and so-and-so year, the ship must roll out. Now, you cannot uh, make shortcuts just to show to the world. And certainly not when your, as I keep saying, ecosystem is not has not been established. Can I just say this, sir, with all humility, each one of these answers is an episode itself. <laughs> and I'm going to put it out. I'm going to put out the big one and I'm going to put out these clips because people need to know each one of these blocks. And it's something, I mean, I've learned a lot today. I, when you read, when I when I do a little reading before I plan this, uh, th this thing, but there's obviously because I don't have that bent of mind, I can only learn that much. But, you know, when it, when it comes out of a person's mouth who's, who's got the experience and the knowledge of, 
but you really want a uh, you know you've got a you've got a not a very good navy and then you have a maritime militia going ramming boats all around the world and uh, it's basically you know the good old saying if you're weak project that you're strong <laughs> you know, that's i would i don't know what the reality is and i'm not sure if anybody does except i don't i, I don't even know if the chinese know what the reality is of their navy so with with the way the system works there i don't think anybody would have done an audit to actually know okay can we do this or not you know it's i wonder and I, with that wonder sir i'm going to leave the audience also with that wonder and thank you so much for actually taking out the time this is going to be a very interesting discussion i'm sure a lot of people are going to love this it's always a pleasure talking to you and learning from you sir till next time thank, thank you. you thank you very much always a pleasure thank you sir